Let's take stock of some of the stuff we've learned so far. We've learned that materials generally have dispersion, which is to say their indices of refraction are functions of wavelength. We've also learned that materials often absorb light, which we can model with indices of refraction that have an imaginary term. And we've learned that real light usually has more than one wavelength. A pulse, for example, is composed of a wide band of wavelengths with a Fourier transform relationship between the temporal and spectral widths. If we combine all these ideas in a particular way, something very interesting happens. Suppose we have a Gaussian pulse of light in the time domain. In the frequency domain, that pulse of light is composed of a whole spread of frequencies centered around some carrier frequency. Now suppose we send that pulse through some material, and that material is highly absorbent at that center frequency omega naught. In the frequency domain, we basically cut out that frequency from the spectrum. Right here I'm just showing the spectrum of what we're going to take out of what already exists. In the time domain, removing that one specific frequency is equivalent to subtracting a pure sine wave from the original signal. And if we actually do that subtraction, we get the following. So this right here should make you uncomfortable. It's showing us that if we delete a frequency from a pulse, that pulse suddenly extends out forever temporally. This is a-causal. An effect precedes a cause. We delete a frequency here, now, at t equals zero, and the effect is for our pulse to suddenly have a tail that existed five years ago. That's really bad. We want physical theories to be causal. It's one of those things we don't really compromise on. So how do we fix that? I mean, absorption does happen, and sometimes it is pretty narrow band. The way out is to realize that all of the other frequencies in the pulse don't just sit there. They get phase shifted in such a way that they still add up to produce a short pulse that doesn't reach back in time to before the absorption event. That turns out to be pretty important. In order to have absorption at a particular frequency and preserve causality, you need to have a fairly complicated series of phase shifts amongst all the other frequencies. And those phase shifts come from the different frequencies getting delayed with respect to one another, which means we necessarily have a frequency-dependent index of refraction, and therefore have dispersion. Put more directly, we can't have a causal theory of electromagnetism unless absorption and dispersion go hand in hand. If a material absorbs light at all, it needs to also be dispersive. I'll write that down and put a bunny on it for emphasis. Now, as is often the case, this physical behavior ties in nicely to a result in mathematics. We talked recently about how in the time domain, we can describe how matter interacts with light using a linear response function, chi. And chi is what we've been calling the susceptibility. In the frequency domain, this integral relationship becomes a simple multiplication. Now, chi is what eventually gets bundled up into the permittivity epsilon, and then the index of refraction n. And since to represent both dispersion and absorption, we write the index as having real and imaginary parts, it follows that the frequency domain representation of the susceptibility chi will also have real and imaginary parts. And here's where things get fun. Some people who are very good at complex analysis proved that if you have a response function that's causal, which is to say it only worries about things that have actually happened so far, then the Fourier transform of that function, the frequency domain response function, must be analytic. And you may recall that an analytic complex function has real and imaginary bits that are related in a very particular way.
The example we usually see in classes like math phys is if we have some function of x and y. If that function is analytic, certain relationships between the real and imaginary parts have to hold. But we can say stuff more general than that. In particular, after doing some crank turning, one can show that the real and imaginary parts of a frequency domain, linear, causal response function are related as such. These are the kramers kronig relations. And physically, what they do is express the real part of the susceptibility in terms of the imaginary part, and vice versa. Since the real and imaginary parts represent dispersion and absorption respectively, what this means is that if you know either of those, you can find the other, which I personally find pretty interesting. And people do actually use this. It's a bit of a chore to directly measure the index of refraction of a material as a function of frequency by just looking at how different colors refract differently. It's often significantly easier to measure the absorption spectrum of a material, which gives you the imaginary part of chi, and then use Kramer's Kronig to back out the real part of chi. So, now we know at least part of what we need to do to keep E and M causal. And that's a good thing. A-causal behavior isn't nearly as much fun in real life as it is in the movies.